No so um, good morning. It's nice to finally connect with you. Good morning. Um, yes. And uh, so I had a couple of questions about the program that you guys are running. Yes. Um, so uh, the first question is um, this study is uh, connect conducted by researchers um, from Columbia University and the University of Wisconsin. Um, who are some researchers associated with this project and departments at those universities? Uh, yes, so the so you're talking specifically about the take up. Yeah, I assume. OK, because that's a, it's that is actually linked to a larger project from Columbia University, so I can tell you the bigger context for it, but we can also talk about the app itself. Uh, so at Columbia, it's uh, myself and then a uh, Pilar Fernandez are the, uh, we are the, the main people in that project. So she actually just got a faculty position in. Um, a, so, so she's still she's still affiliated with us, but she got a faculty position at Washington State University. I can send you everything if, if you want in an email or something with the names and is, if you want the specific departments, I would have to check. Would that work? Yeah, that would work fine. OK, and then in Wisconsin, there's a um, Susan Paskowitz is the PI, and then there's a number of other people that are involved. So the app is actually being produced in Wisconsin. The IT group is there, uh, but then we, you know, in terms of all the other, the operational aspects and the design and the all the rest, it, it's in collaboration between the two. So the important thing is that we're both part of a centers of excellence in vector-borne diseases. There's two, there's five centers that are funded by CDC to study vector-borne diseases. And so one is in the Northeast, the other one is in the Midwest. So we're both, you know, part of the uh, the leadership of those centers. And so this is a project in collaboration between those two. Okay, cool. Um, so there seems to be a lot of people involved. Do you know offhand how many people are involved um, altogether? Uh, so the most active are two people, two postdocs, Pilar Fernandez and Vini Gibron, uh, who used to be postdocs. They're not anymore. And then faculty, it's myself and I would say maybe two, three. Uh, There's also Michigan, so three, four, I would say six, like in the leadership. And then, of course, we hire, you know, students and uh, assistants to do. And then there's the IT group. So there's about two people mainly involved there. I would say 10. Ten like faculty slash you know more technical staff IT staff, and then we hire you know other or our other students involved. Uh, every year we there's usually another group involved. So it's been going on since 2018. Okay. And um, so this was a la uh, third year in 2020. Okay. I mean, and yeah. have you gotten a lot of data so far from the uh, the tick app? Yes, so we have a, I would have to look at the actual number of users. Uh, so we have um, a couple of papers that came out. Uh, so the TICAP is available for the whole country. And so most, you know, anywhere people can download it. But since, but we use it to support projects on the ground that each of our groups have. So we have this project on Staten Island that is our focal project that is part of the, the larger project. So we actually recruit people to use the app actively there. Um, and I don't have the latest numbers off the top of my head. Again, th that I can also send to you. Uh, but yeah, we, you know, we always want, want more. But the thing with the app is that it requires a lot of input from people. We ask a lot of questions, so it's hard sometimes to get people to use it. It's not just an app that people look up a map of ticks or so it's a research tool. So we try to obtain, um, you know, we uh, we require a, a, what is called IRB, like human resources. So people have to sign up, like when you go to the doctor, you know, sign up that you are releasing your information. And so those are uh, things that make it harder to recruit people. But we do have a good, you know, good few hundreds from Staten Island. Some of them are very, very, you know, they are repeated users. And so this year, actually, we got a, a, from last year data, a really interesting data on the effect of COVID. So that's kind of the latest we had um, because we compared our data from 2019 and 20. And then we look at the data before and after 2020 with uh, after the lockdown. And so we have a, um, we're finally actually finalizing this paper that shows that people use outdoor places a lot more often 
in 2020 compared to 2019, and there were 30% more ticket, tick, reported tick exposures then. And we also could quantify that a lot of people switched from, you know, the outdoor uh, activities in, in natural parks went down like 70%, but then the backyard uh, activities went up significantly and made up for that difference, basically. And, and that's kind of anecdotally in the press. You hear, you know, the lows of like, people going out to get stuff because we were all stuck at home and bored. But we did find that that was significant, that, that uh, it, it increased tick encounters. So that's kind of our focus, of course, I mean, our focus. And we also looked at, uh, we asked some questions about well-being and how people felt, you know, with the COVID situation and so we also uh, have some data on on that. So that last year was special, but of course, you know, uh, like for everything. Um, but we had this interesting tool that monitors uh, how people use the outdoors and how that might relate to their tick risk, which is our overall, uh, you know, the overall goal of the app. Okay, cool. Um, so one of the questions that I, I just was thinking while you were saying that, um, what made you choose uh, Staten Island in particular? Yeah, so we, you know, I'm interested, I'm a disease ecologist and I've worked on tick and mosquito-borne diseases, in particular ticks. And so I, I actually moved to Columbia University six years ago and uh, was interested in, you know, more local projects. And so obviously Staten Island is the one borough that has a lot of, uh, you know, green spaces and deer and ticks. Uh, so we actually, my first PhD student that is finishing this year, she did a survey of New York City. She published this uh, throughout a, num a number of city parks, and she found Staten Island clearly being the one where we there's a lot of ticks established. And there was one site in the Bronx that had uh, some, but and so that is how we decided. Well, you know, that's the place to do this type of research, and um, and then we build up a whole project. Now we are funded by NSF and also the CDC project. Uh, is the project is called a couple natural human systems and so it's pretty novel because most people do don't work on tick-borne diseases in urban areas uh, it's more like you know suburban or rural areas Staten Island is kind of in the fringe of being you know relatively dense populated being part of New York City but at the same time very green and so we it's a really interesting place to study this interaction between people nature and then how that relates to tick-borne diseases uh, so, yeah, I thought it was, um, and and the, the whole network of parks there make it really interesting to study how that affects wildlife, connectivity, and then in that context, how, you know, tick-borne diseases. We're actually going to expand to mosquito-borne probably next uh, summer more intensely as well. Uh, so it's kind of the benefits that are clear of a lot of the natural, you know, green spaces. That's so important and so essential for all we do. But unfortunately, there's some of these, we call them e these services or, uh, you know, unexpected uh, effects that we need to be aware of and we need to uh, prepare for and, 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 and do something about. Okay. Um, and then... Uh are there any students or classes uh, participating in the TIC app? I know you had mentioned that there was one student who uh, kind of did the research in New York City, um, but are there a lot of students participating in classes in particular schools? Yes, so the classes usually, I mean, most of our activity, the strongest activities are in the summer, so we don't have really classes linked to that. I teach DCC ecology and, you know, sometimes talk about the results. But we have, a, every summer, we have a number of students involved. It's from Columbia and other places, from Staten Island as well sometimes. We had, in 2019, we had a team of almost almost 15 people, I would say, on the island all summer. Doing, you know, going from all the, the levels, from postdoc to, you know, grad students, PhDs, you know, um, masters and undergraduates of all levels. And then we also hire more technical assistants. This that's for 2020, we because most of our, we do two types of activity. One is we go to the parks and we collect uh, mice there. I mean, we put traps for mice and then we put cameras. So we record what type of wildlife there is. That's in eight of the, eight or more of the parks throughout Staten Island. So that we call the nature, nature part of it. And then the human side, we have a team that visits people's backyards and collect sticks. And last year we also put like 
traps for mice uh, and for uh, cameras as well to understand how wildlife interacts with people in their own backyards. And th those people will recruit to use the app. And so the so that is kind of the the, uh, the meat of our work, and the app supplements that. Plus, you know, the app is available everywhere, so we also have data from anybody in the country, anybody that wants to use it. Uh, but the the actual involvement in the app is so we had one student that specifically was involved in the app because people send us photos of ticks, and so they had to identify which tick it is and inform people. So that was a full time person just doing that every summer. But the rest of the work, you know, is all remote. And so most of our work is uh, from people from this larger project of visiting yards and collecting data on wildlife. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty, a lot of, you know, quite a, a lot of students are involved in, and we're trying to get more Staten Island involvement actually. But um, and so we got a couple of people before that more local and have more no, local knowledge, but uh, you know, usually a lot of Columbia people get involved. Okay. Um, how did the Tick app come to be? Was it conceived of or coded by students, or was it um, like how how did it come to be basically? Yeah, so we actually had um, a what would you call it? Um, uh, there's a word for it, but like a pre prequel of it. Uh, but it was actually a researcher that approached me and said, "I want to develop an app." For tech stuff, and we did that in, in 2017. So that app was pretty uh, rough, I would say, and we learned a lot. It had a lot of problems. We didn't get a lot of success, um, but it was a, a learning, a huge learning opportunity. So in 2018, we, you know, we sat down again and said, "Well, let's beef that up." And actually, there was funding from the CDC centers, uh, especially the the Midwest Center had specific funding for it. So we basically said, well, let's vamp, revamp this with the knowledge we had at Columbia from this previous app and uh, let's build that one that is, you know, really more professional and looks good and it's usable. So, yeah, it was more at that level. Um, the students then got it was developed by a professional group that develops app for for health, basically. OK, cool. Um, and you said funding for this study is provided by the CDC. Um, how long is the funding slated to continue for presently? Yeah, so it's uh, it's ending this year, 2021, for the app. Uh, the the grant we have, the NSF grant that also supports, you know, some of this work, is one more year, 2022. So we're looking for ways to maintain it and also how how we can make it be better or different, you know. I don't think it's going to stay in the same uh, format. We were thinking of making, and one of the things we want to make it is more, um, build more of an intervention in it. So we've had a little pilot this year where we, uh, half of the users got a, 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 um, a message saying, you know, have you checked for ticks today? Or like, like an educational message. And we work with a communications person actually to build those. And um, we haven't analyzed those data yet, but, that is something we'd like to do you know that it hasn't been done before have a, like some sort of mini intervention we actually find a slight effect of it but you know it's very hard to change people's behaviors in terms of protecting themselves that's a big part of the of the app is teaching people how, how you know how to protect themselves from ticks and uh, learn about ticks you know like if you get exposed to it where are the ticks you know how to take care of them and so um, that's what something we'd like to do more of, just help, you know, control it, not just learn about it, but now move on to more of a, an intervention phase. But yeah, we would need funding to keep it going. So we're not, not sure uh, the centers are hopefully will be renewed. Uh, it takes quite a bit of money, though, to fund the app. So it would we have to see whether that versus other projects will be prioritized. We don't know. OK. Um, and how will it serve the American population to learn more about Lyme uh, disease transmission? Um, well, you know, Lyme disease is a huge problem. It's the main uh, vector-borne disease uh, by far. There, there's an estimate of more than 400,000 cases uh, currently a year in the U.S. So those numbers, you know, are outstanding, are just like really scary numbers. It keeps going up uh, and we are struggling to find a solution 
to it. You know, we have a number of different solutions, but uh, none of them works really well or it damages the environment. If you use pesticides, you know, there's just so it's just such a complex problem. And so the 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 first the individual uh, protection, you know, it's always the ultimate thing. You know, I, I don't think we'll find an intervention that will get rid of ticks for sure or, or of the pathogen because it's a zoonotic disease. It exists in nature. It can't you, we can't get rid of it. And so what we could do is um, ameliorate it or reduce the risk, but there's always going to have to be this individual protection and awareness. Um, unfortunately, you always, if you live in a tick area, you'll have to check for ticks, even if you're spraying, you know, you can reduce your risk, but not eliminate it. So I think there's a lack of knowledge, you know, from simple things. We noticed uh, when we went house by house, we have a, a little uh, Petri dish, like a little container with different ticks and we ask people what they think uh, what tick or what what which ones are ticks and which ones they think they're getting them sick and almost always they don't know which one it is and when and they don't know how small the nymphs that get you sick are that they're side of a you know the poppy seed so even simple things like that that they think they know they check yes i check for ticks but then they oh, no i don't check for that small <laughs> it's things like simple things that i think just education and, um, you know, an increasing awareness can can help. Um, and so that's our hope, you know, to try to to help reduce the risk and also for us to learn more where the risk is and which are the risky behaviors. Uh, one of the things that the app is aiming to do is to understand whether most people are getting the ticks in their backyard or when they go hiking or, or walking in the parks in, in on Staten Island or beyond. So that's something the app can tell us and so if we're gonna have a control intervention should we focus on backyards should we focus on parks uh, where are people getting most ticks for example and so a lot of that is you know to inform public interventions and then to educate so those two things I would say okay um, and so the, what would be the ultimate goals of the tip app uh, project yeah, so I'm, as I mentioned, it would be, you know, gather information on the risky behaviors, the, the location where most of the risk occurs, and is develop and start developing an, uh, an intervention. That would be the next generation of the app would require possibly, you know, renewed funding. Let's say if we can get funding for five more years, we could switch it to an intervention tool. So an educational intervention tool. So that's the, that would be our, our ideal goal. And so we have some of the pilot data done already, um, but we would need to have more reach. So that's the other thing that we're trying to think of ways in which it will be less cumbersome for people to download it, or maybe they will be more willing to use it and how we can advertise it too. So that would be really important. I mean, we got quite a bit of press in the first year because it was new. So I appreciate that you're contacting us again. You know, everything when it's new, you come up, but we want it sustainable, you know, and we want it to, to keep up uh, so people are aware and use it. Uh, people that, some people were very happy with it. And, uh, and we hope also having this insights into, you know, this crazy COVID year. You know, a lot of the tick-borne disease research uh, sorry, I'm going off of the, the question, but a lot of last year, we there was probably lots of Lyme disease, but the reporting was lower. People didn't go to the doctor. So we are looking into that. Um, a tool like the app lets us get that remotely, you know, get a, every person in their own house with the app is telling us, you know, there's actually 30% more tick bites, but the, we suspect the, the numbers are not out yet, but because they're all the issues with reporting and there may be look like there was less Lyme disease, but there was probably more. And so, so it's a great tool for surveillance as well. So I would say tool for surveillance, help us learn where people are getting exposed and what behaviors are linked to it. And then, but then turn it next generation, turning into an educational and, and an intervention tool. Um, do users of the app have to fill out the daily log like every day for 15 days or only when they find a tick? So, and what will this serve to do? Yes, so we, we ask them to fill it every day because the idea is, you know, the negative, even if you don't find a tick, that's information for us. So sometimes scientists don't think in those terms because then I, I see, well, which, which activities you did that linked it to you finding a tick versus those that where you didn't get a tick on you. So if not, we, uh, that's why we asked for every day for 15 days. 
a lot of people actually the first year understood that they had to do it every time they found a tick. So we were trying to be very clear that we would like you to do it every day, uh, either you found it or not. Of course, if you find a tick, then you report a tick, which is another feature. But that is a separate feature. I mean, it's linked to it, but we always want you to report. But you, we, the behavioral stuff should go every day. Okay. Um, when reporting a tick, uh, how important are photographs? And um, how should they be taken? And is a macro lens necessary? Um, yes, photographs are you know essential for for us to be able to tell you what kind of tick it is. And no, you don't need a macro lens. So just uh, there's instructions in the app as to how to do it, how to position your camera, and uh, you know the 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 clearer the better, of course. So we can identify the tick. And if you can take it on both sides of the tick, then we can look at features on on both sides. So the, um, the identification we think has been pretty successful, you know, uh, especially the common ticks. Uh, and then it's harder when the tick has taken some blood from you because it's really round and it's kind of hard to see the key fe features. But um, yes, yeah, so that there, then we can tell you which tick, if it's a black legged tick or, or another one, the risk of disease is very different. So it's important to know which, which tick it is. Okay. Um, have there been any new types of ticks discovered in North America, either with your app or just in general recently? Yes. So there's a longhorn tick, uh, the Asian longhorn tick. So that's been reported in the last few years. So we found that it was actually present before it was actually discovered. People were not paying attention to it because it kind of looks similar to another tick. But it's been two for last two years. Uh, we've known it pretty well. And at Staten Island, actually, our program was one of the first to find it, <coughs> even in the U.S. I mean, one of the among the first group because there's lots of it on Staten Island. So especially in the South, uh, it is uh, clearly increasing in abundance. It's almost overcoming the other two ticks, which is the deer tick. Well, there's three ticks. So there's the dog tick, the black-legged tick that causes Lyme disease. The lone star tick that is also coming in from the south, and then the longhorn tick. So those four main ticks on Staten Island. <coughs> and it looks like almost like the black-legged tick is being displaced by two of the others. We don't know if that's, um, that's a real thing or if they're competing in any way, or they're, but it, it, we're following that very closely. The good news is the Asian longhorn tick so far doesn't look like it, it transmits any pathogens in the U.S., although in the Southeast Asia where it's from, it does, you know, pretty bad pathogens, including some hemorrhagic fever virus. So it could potentially, but it seems like it comes, came to the U.S., you know, without any pathogens or at least the offspring of them didn't. And uh, so far we haven't found much on it, although there's occasional reports um, like yeah, I would say so far we haven't really found them infected. So in that, that's good news. But we can't lower our guard because they can adapt. You know, they can start biting our mice and our other animals and start getting that pathogen and potentially transmitting it later. You know, some of these pathogens then adapt to a new vector. Uh, they may or may not. So we don't know yet. Um, so how can someone use the tick activity information to make better choices? Um, must they avoid woodlands during these times to avoid risk of Lyme disease? Yeah, so we present very kind of general information on the times of uh, the activity times of the ticks. Um, we, kn we know that it the black legged ticks in particular, the riskier time of the year is in May, late May and June. That's where most of the nymphs, which is the intermediate size tick, are active and most of when people get infected. So, for example, in August, um, the nymphs are almost gone and so the larvae are active, but the larvae typically are not infected with anything. So, I would say yes. You know, I, I mean, you always have to be careful, but I would say the worst time is June, late May, June. And we provide that information in the tick. We opted for not, um, you know, some of the other tick have people posting, um, you know, when people find like interactive where you post where, where you find the tick and then it's uploaded to the app. <coughs> 
because the problem is that uh, the adult ticks, which are, are active, let's say, March, April, and also in the fall, those are the ones people find because they are larger. But then hits May and June hits, and that those ticks are so small that people do not find them. So if we had people reporting, it would look like the ticks went away. When is the time actually when most of the ticks are the dangerous ones, the little ones are out? So we don't want to post those things. We think it's um, that other apps do actually. We think it's misleading uh, and it would be worse. So we just provide uh, the information we have because we know when the ticks are out because we go collect them, you know. And so we post that kind of that information rather than citizen derived information that may be, yeah, maybe leading the wrong in the wrong direction. Okay, um, so uh, the black-legged tick, um, Ixodes scapularis, transmits many diseases. Um, is it possible there are more bacteria that have been have yet to be discovered out in the wilds of Staten Island or other U.S. woodland locations? Uh, yeah, certainly there could be. So that's uh, an active area of research. In the last, um, I would say, in the last. 10 years, we've discovered three more, like another two other species of Borrelia mainly and another Ehrlichia human pathogen. So uh, every two or three years, we're finding something else, either Borrelia or uh, bacteria or so <coughs> viruses. We haven't found any new ones yet, but, uh, but yeah, definitely bacteria. We keep finding new ones. So there is a possibility. So people are, you know, we, we're always on the lookout for, for discovering new things. But um, yeah, especially because there's so many ticks that are vectors. So it's not just on scapularis. It could be one in, in lone star ticks also or dog ticks. Yeah, so we, we need to be always watching. Okay. Um, and why, <laughs> I guess, um, what, uh, if from a scientific standpoint, um, what, what is the theory as far as why ticks carry so many pathogens? Um, compared to mosquitoes or compared to like mosquitoes or even bed bugs and things of that nature, yeah. which don't carry that many, like they might carry a few, or rather if they carry them, they don't transmit them as, uh, as much. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons is that they, they stay on the host for so long. So there's a lot of opportunities to transmit the pathogens back and forth. You know, they stay on us for three to five days and uh, versus a mosquito that it would be seconds. And so mosquitoes transmit mostly viruses that are transmitted really fast. <coughs> um, but then our, um, I would say, yeah, the mechanism by which bacteria, a bacteria are transmitted, especially through ticks, requires a long time. So the, the way it works is the, the bacteria is actually in the mid gut, the gut of the tick when it bites. And so then it has to reproduce, the, the tick takes the blood meal and then it reproduces and it takes days, yeah, day and a half. You know how, like they say, it, you, you have to have the tick on for a day and a half or two to transmit because that's how long it takes for the bacteria to get from the gut to the saliva of the tick and into you. <coughs> so that process is a uh, very long. And I think the fact, yeah, that the tick can attach, has the, have that ability to attach for so long is, is the key, I would say. I mean, we don't know for sure, but that uh, kind of makes sense. Be um, and, the, and the fact that they can attach for so long is because they have that saliva, you know, that gives it anesthesia and we're not feeling them, which is pretty unique. It's really, a, you know, it's sad, <laughs> it's bad for us, but it's pretty amazing what they, what they can do to stay there. And no other vector does that. So whereas like a, a flea or a mosquito, they, they're pretty fast. They don't really have as much yes, time. Because we develop an immune response against them and we itch or, you know, we can tell they are there. But the ticks basically uh, have an immunosuppressant. They just kind of uh, deal with, they have a cocktail of, of uh, enzymes and proteins that uh, basically anesthetize it and like get our immune system down, down. And so that's how they do it. But it's a very, very special, yeah, very specific to ticks. Okay. Um, so Staten Island has no shortage of ticks. Um, what types have been reported here historically 
or through the app and does this change over time have you, have you noticed like a, a change over over the years of different um, ticks being reported here yeah so as i mentioned that there's a dog tick the black leg tick the lone star tick and the longhorn tick and so the dog ticks look like they're being like uh, the dog ticks are more like in marshy areas uh, or like uh, grassy areas and people get you no know, dogs get a lot of ticks when they get there but in more forested areas so the habitat has changed the reforestation and the the forest you have in your background is a perfect site for black-legged ticks and so that's what in general in the u.s reforestation has and deer numbers has brought up the the deer ticks uh, deer's numbers have exploded in the last 20 years on staten island and in the country and so that has definitely brought them and also the lone star tick basically so those have been increasing in the last 20 years or so and have replaced the dog tick or I mean, or at least be more important than the dog pig. And the long corn tick has been a matter of two, three years, three years, I would say, that we've had it. And it, they're all on, on deer, the, not the dog ticks, but the long corn, the lone star, and the black leg ticks rely on deer. So that's definitely a factor. I mean, the adults feed on deer. I mean, all the, all the, the adults depend on deer, but the younger ones, I, I, I don't know if you know the cycle, they feed on smaller mammals, mice, and other hosts so they also depend on those but those are usually not in short supply you know in urban areas but deer of course are you know there's no deer on, in central park that's why there's no ticks <laughs> so that's something my, my student found you know basically the more isolated the parks are the, and the harder that it is for deer to get there the less you know likely to be ticks um and how has participation been on staten island so it's been okay. We wish there was more. Um, we had a again. I, I can email you the, the actual numbers, but um, I think it's been okay. We unfortunately, as we were building up to the 2020, we were going to have a huge season, and that didn't happen. So I feel like you know people get, were getting more and more informed about what you're uh, doing, and and so I would say okay. But it uh, we were hoping for more, uh, but but that requires our work on the ground, which we, we can do. So. Yeah, that was the problem with the pandemia, pandemia. but um, the people have been very open to let us go into their yards, which we were surprised. So that's really nice. You know, they opened their doors for us to go check their backyards. We didn't know. We, we just, you know, ring the bells, literally. <laughs> and sometimes they think we're selling something often and they uh, ignore us, which I totally understand. But a lot of people have been you know, opening and welcoming and being interested because they know they're concerned, you know, they know, especially in the neighborhoods where there's, that's a problem, they are interested and, and want, want more down about it. Um, and uh, how did you spread the word about the app? So we use social media. We had some focus groups in like in, in like the um, community centers, we also talk, talk, yeah, we, we talked with some community groups. So we did a lot in the 2018. Um, then also the um, borough president, you know, with like a lot of social media from the health department, the borough president, and, and tried to advertise that. Again, we had a big push at the beginning. Then it becomes hard to get attention from anybody because it's already ongoing. Um, but I think also the in-person workshops we were planning to do more of uh, last year are good because that, that's kind of when people come in and also learn about it. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. And in the paper, in the, your, I guess your competition paper, <laughs> the, the Staten Island, what is it? The, oh my God, what's, yeah, uh, that we are posted in the paper as well. Staten Island, I can't remember the name. <laughs> and uh, what are your uh, participation goals? In terms like, of numbers? Example, yeah, in terms of like numbers or percentage of population, stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we were hoping for, yeah, I, I can't remember, I think 500 total people, but that may not be in the same year. Uh, that was something, you know, a number we kind of, came up with in terms of data. So I'm not sure how close we are. And it more than the goal, because of, in 2018, in particular, we got people not doing the daily survey. So that was the main thing. A lot of people downloaded, 
and filled out the first questionnaire. So we actually published a paper just with that because that describes what, how, what are the different risks and behaviors of people. Uh, but then the daily survey is a challenge. Just keep people doing that for 15 days uh, regularly. It's very hard. So that's been the hardest. And last year we got, yeah, we, we were a little high, happier with it, but that keeps being the hardest thing to achieve. So yeah, emphasizing that that daily survey, that's a real epidemiological data that we need to have. Um, so uh, when in your in your research um, or perhaps in, in your own knowledge, um, how fast uh, approximately do ticks spread outward from a single tick deposited by, let's say, a bird? So birds, so ticks don't move. They pretty much don't move at all. It's like a meter, maybe. Uh, they only move on hosts. So the um, yeah, the ticks will not spread on their own almost at all. Maybe a meter. But uh, so the ticks, depending on, so they will, an, an, any animal will drop them off, and then they will spend months in the ground and mold to the next stage, and then get on the next animal, and then they will be moved again. And so they will be moved depending on the host they get onto, by basically. Okay. So if um, you know, if it's on a deer, the deer can move, you know, long distance on the island. Although they tend to stay. So we have some deer with collars from the sterilization program. They put collars on them, and we are analyzing that data. We, you know, we work, we work with them on. Um, we got ticks from their deer, and then they also shared with us some of the collar data. We also have some female, 10 female deer, well, nine, one died um, with collars because they, you know, the sterilization program, I assume, or? Yeah, you, you, when you say collars, you mean those ear tag things that they have in the ears? Yeah. Uh, they're actually collars. Yeah, the, the ear tag is just the number, and then they have a collar that has a GPS that, <coughs> that describes the, the location. So you can see how they're moving and how much they move, where they go. So so the ear tags aren't even really essential. They're just a number. They could literally stop using those if they wanted to. No, no. The ear tag is it's a number. They need to see it because that's how they identify. Only a subset of those deer have a collar. But you, you don't know. You need a tag to identify the deer. So you know uh, which one it is, basically. And so we know we tag that deer in whatever year and you see it again. And so that provides information for sure. Uh, but then the colors are better information. It's just very expensive, super expensive. And so a subset of males have that, that have been uh, sterilized. And we put them for our research on females because we wanted to compare uh, only nine females because we don't have much money. But there's hundreds of deer with colors over the time. So it's great information. So that's one of the things we use to see how much the deer move. And one of our research projects are uh, understanding how much the potential for deer to bring in ticks into your yard. And so we look at, okay, how often deer that we're analyzing as we speak, as a dissertation project, uh, how the deer that spend, you know, how, how often deer that spend time in the forest then visit the backyards and what type of neighborhoods are being visited more often and what types of features might be limiting the visits actually so we when we go house by house we write down if you have a fence if you have a feeder if you have you know everything in your yard that may attract or detract the ho the animals uh, and we also put colors on raccoons so just in general how much wildlife you know visits people's backyards and so we are currently working on that and um because we think you know the deer need the forest for protection but then get a lot of food and things from people's homes so trying to kind of quantify that. Uh, but yeah, every every movement of a host is linked to movements of ticks. So that's why we study the animals, the wildlife. And so raccoons are a vector as well? The raccoons move ticks around for sure. And they can infect with Lyme disease. They can, although, but they're not very good at it. So a small proportion of the ticks will get infected from a raccoon, but they can. Same with an opossum. Opossum is even, yeah, not very good at infecting them, but they can. And um, almost all the animals can potentially infect ticks. The mice are the best and the shrews. Uh, and the other thing we're doing, we're just starting on that is looking at what the ticks fed on. That's a very novel technology, actually. We get ticks from the ground and we can tell from molecular studies with a collaborator what the ticks fed on. So we know who's moving the ticks more often. 
um, which has been really hard to do, but uh, we're kind of getting to that as well. So that's another way. You either catch the host and you see which ticks are on it and you see if they're infected or you find ticks on the ground and we, we get with a drag cloth, with a cloth and you can tell what they fed on and if they're infected. So that's so sort of the ways in which we, we can tell which animals are feeding and infecting more ticks. And uh, the the animals that are infecting the ticks, they don't like have symptoms that like we would have. They they just it's just like an endemic thing that doesn't do anything to them. Lyme disease, right? Correct. Yeah, there may be very, very other diseases too. I guess it's not a disease for them. It's that we call it an infection. So we it's like when you're infected, you don't like COVID. You, you know, you don't even know it. It doesn't do anything to you. So it turns out no, a we call it a disease when it actually provokes symptoms. So animals don't get anything. They might have a very slight effect, but it has it's almost undetectable. It's pretty much they're adapted to it. Yeah, they just live with it and doesn't do anything to them. Okay. And um, you had said that ticks don't really walk or hop or jump or anything like that, or, or do they do that? No, they just, uh, I mean, they walk, but very little, just mostly vertical walk. So they go up, up the leaf litter or a branch and they wait for the host, they ho what they call questing, we call it. Uh, and then they, but then they get very dry and then they have to come down. Dryness is the worst for them because they don't really drink water or anything. And so they need to come down to the leaf litter and get humid, uh, absorb humidity. And so then they can come up again and look for an animal to help to attach to. They have like be Velcro, you can think of Velcro legs. They attach to, they don't jump. Okay. They, yeah. You have to brush against them and they'll attach to you. And uh, what are some interventions that you have found that might be helpful when it comes to staying safe and uh, tick free? So, um, interventions, you mean uh, individuals? I mean, so people can do stuff. So things can be done at multiple levels, right? So at the level of like the whole island, you can reduce deer numbers, let's say, or which is very difficult to do, but that can have some impact. Uh, then at the level of your, or, or kill the ticks on the deer, which people have done, which is called for poster that they put insecticides on deer to kill the ticks. Uh, that, that has an effect at like at a neighbor, a whole neighborhood. Then at the level of your own home, you can put a tall fence that we found that it could work if it's tall enough. Um, and uh, then they, you can, that we're still examining, we haven't found, so, so, and then you can spray your yard, you know, with insecticide. So we found that the, the ones that really work are um, a per permethrin, so um, synthetics pesticides. Unfortunately, the organics don't seem to be working so well. So a lot of people are putting organics, but they don't seem to really work too well. We haven't found a good organic pesticide. So that's one of the big missing things from the Lyme research, that people will be comfortable, they will be uh, safer to the environment, um, so that that's a big limitation. Then there's a, a there's a called mouse um, devices that can put kill the ticks on the mice in your yard. Mouse, mouse uh, boxes they're called. Uh, that's another thing you can do. Or I mean, anytime you you separate yourself from the ticks, like if you have a barrier, like not be where there's leaf litter. So the the mo the riskier is like the vegetation, low vegetation and leaf litter is where the ticks are. So if, if you have a yard and you try to stay away from that, if you, the, uh, the ticks are typically not on the lawn, on the just open, sunny lawn. So that's another thing you can do. So from the point of view of the individual, you can, you know, use spray yourself, uh, use long pants, tuck them in your socks, spray them with permethrin. So that's, um, that's uh, there's this uh, pesticide that you can actually spray your clothes in and it becomes uh, impregnated with it. And so that is very effective, actually. And not a lot of people use them or know about it. So you don't spray your skin with it, just your clothes, and it stays on it. And they sell clothes that already have it in it, or you can do it yourself. So that's what our, our team does in the field. They use that, and it's pretty safe. And then use DEET on your skin. That's, <coughs> that is safe as well. Um, so, and then, of course, when you come in, you... I take a shower is the best because some ticks will be crawling and you can get rid of them and check for ticks. Nothing's going to replace the checking for the ticks, I would say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are things 
it's just hard for people to do them. But those are things that if you do them, I mean, I know people that live in very ticky areas and they and they never got Lyme disease in, in, and they check their ticks. You know, if you're very diligent in doing that, um, you could, but it is a lot of work. Okay. Um, and uh, last year we interviewed uh, TikTok, which was actually what you mentioned with the, ba the bait boxes. That was actually the company that yep. does the mouse uh, things. So um, would you say that there are many different alternative ways to uh, prevent yourself from, you know, getting ticks on you? Or is it pretty much you're going to get ticks on, you just have to make sure you check? I would say that... Um... I would say you just have to check. I mean, we uh, best experience is our field workers that are in tick country all day long. <coughs> we got so few people getting Lyme disease, one in hundreds, I would say. So you can do it. I mean, it depends on your personality. But there, our field team is hyper, hyper aware. They know they're in tick country all the time. They check thoroughly and constantly, and they, and they don't get ticks. So it's doable. It's just, I mean, they still check. And they still find them sometimes because they, there's an opening in the in the clothes that they didn't realize. But these people are super exposed. It's like the you know healthcare workers with COVID in the forefront of that kind of exposure. And so if they can do it, I think it can be done. But of course, you have other things if you you know if you can spare the time, and it's a, a lot of work. <coughs> I would I would still check anytime I'm in a in an area where there's ticks. I I, I would never stop doing that. Um, where do the ticks live on the deer? Where? Yes. Um, so mostly in the head and in the legs, <coughs> because that's what gets into the leaf litter. They don't curl up too much. So yeah, it's in the legs up to a certain height and then all of the face. Okay, so they actually have them all over their faces, even yeah. the females, because I know I had read somewhere that on their antlers they reproduce. Well, yeah. Is that is that how, is that actually the case? Because that was some time ago that I had read that that they actually mate on the antlers. The, yeah, antlers and face everywhere. Yeah, not just, but more. I would say more the face and the antlers. But uh, they they are in the antlers as well, especially when they are irrigated, like when they're growing and have enough blood in there. I guess at some point, not in the dry part. So it's when they still have, you know, they need blood. So. So the, the ticks do actually reproduce on the deer themselves. So they mate on the deer and then the females drop off with and then develop the eggs in the ground. <coughs> but they do, yeah, they do mate there and, and then they lay the eggs and die, basically. Okay. Um, do ticks have a place in the ecosystem? Like, what would happen if ticks went extinct in our local eco ecosystem? Like, is there something that they provide or something that they do? I don't, you know, there's nothing specific. They, they don't have a lot of predators. It's not like any predator will depend on them. Um, most predation is like fungi that, you know, attack them. Like, um, so I would say no. I don't think that ticks would... Um, you know, you never know if uh, everything has some sort of place, but it's not like any host or any animal will go extinct if they go, for example. Um, so I would say not specifically, you know, beyond they're just an organism like everything else. But I mean, <coughs> yeah, that's, I guess, my <laughs> answer. Um, what do ticks do when it's freezing out, such as like now? They are just there. They don't do anything. They're very resistant to, to cold. So they don't die. You know, they can live in Canada. They have, it has to be very cold for them to die. So they just stay there. But every time the temperature goes above 5 degrees centigrade, so can, in the upper 30s, they can be active and host, looking for hosts. So that's another thing people may not be aware. You know, if it's in the 40s, for sure, you can have ticks already looking for hosts. The adults have that capacity yet. So, so when it's actually below five degrees centigrade, the, will they just like hang out in the ground and just, just wait? You know? Yeah, yeah. just uh, yeah. They, they develop, they grow, you know, to the next stage when the temperatures are high enough. But when they're at that temperature, they don't do anything. They just, yeah, stay there. 
Okay. Um, are there any extinct kinds of ticks that have been found in amber, for example, or fossilized in another way that aren't still around anymore? I don't know. I actually haven't heard. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, do you know how old is... In, sorry, in five minutes, I have another meeting. So if you can... I don't know if you have any key questions, but... No, I just have two more questions left. Okay, sure. <laughs> do you know how old is the tick, like, in the environment? Like, how long has it been around? Is it, like, something that's been around for, like, millions of years, thousands of years? Do oh, they have any evidence of that? Oh, for sure, millions. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, that's for sure. And even the Borrelia, the bacteria, has been around for millions of years. So that's been around for a long time. We know that from gen gen genetic work. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it has diversified probably during glaciation into the species that we have today, like uh, tens of thousands of years. But, um, but that's, yeah, they're in ex exist for a long time. <laughs> And um, why is it so important uh, to keep people from getting Lyme disease? Well, you know, it's a, it could be a very severe disease. I mean, if it's not caught on time. So most people uh, that catch it, they take, take doxycycline and get cured. Um, that's a majority of people. Uh, there's a little misunderstanding thinking that a lot of people never get cured. But if you catch it on time and you take your medicine, most people will get cured completely. So that's why it's so important to catch it on time. Now, if you don't catch it on time, you can get symptoms, you know, uh, remaining or arthritis or, you know, cardiac symptoms that don't get fully. I mean, again, there's some discussion about that. But in principle, once you realize and you take the, the antibiotics, you get cured as well. But there can be some sequela, you know, other things that remain. So it can be very debilitating or disease if not treated, but especially if it's not caught. So that's the hardest thing, just to know you got it. So um, that is so important because it's treatable if you if you find out. If not, it can, you know, it can give you pretty bad symptoms. So so yeah, it's an important disease. So um that's all the questions that I had. Is there anything else that you would like to share? Um, um sorry, I'm getting another <laughs> I find it. I don't know what that is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, the message, you know, we're, we're hoping to have a season this year. So in terms of people participating, it would be great to get as many participants as we can. The app will be going on for sure. And um, and the app, again, it's a nice resource, even if we have COVID, situ uh, COVID situation, because, we, you know, we can also get people, people may have more time to get involved in, in things like that. <laughs> and uh and report their activities so hopefully you know just a call for people to use the app and uh also be aware that we'll we'll try to be on the ground if if covid allows us to uh, maybe later in the summer and uh yeah just people to take care and and be watchful uh, this could be can be a very treatable disease but you have to be aware and uh and thinking about how ways we can as a community you know increase awareness and, and protect ourselves Okay, well, I, I actually appreciate your time, you're taking the time to speak with us. And um, once everything is up, once the article is up and the video is up, I'll definitely send you um, a link to it so you can see. Um, and, uh, and I'll also send you a link to, I had written a brief article about this uh, right, right when I contacted you for the first time, which I think was right before the holidays. Um, so, uh, and if there's anything else that you wanted to add, and I know that there were a couple of things um, that you were going to email me about specifically, like the number of researchers involved in the product, in the project, like the researchers that are actually involved, whenever you have time. Um, okay. And, um, if there's anything else you wanted to share with us at Islanders, um, just let us know. And, uh, and it was really great speaking with you. No problem. Thanks for contacting me. And thanks for the interest in the topic. No problem. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye.